It won't be out of place to rename Leki Peninsula the Bola Tinubu Peninsula. Indeed, the prime land legally acquired from the Leki Axis is enough to build the Leki Ekwe Road without burdening residents and all the taxpayers with a 30-year concession toll road. One wonders why the EFCC appears compromised on matters concerning Tinubu. If not, how come he has not been charged to court, despite several petitions against him, and in spite of Nuhu Ribadu's boastful claims that he had enough evidence to nail him? One of the governors, we think, we took close to about 75% of the resources of the state. One governor took 75% of the money yeah. from the state government? And this is a state that is probably made over a billion dollars in terms of revenue. Or was it the reason he gave his ACN presidential ticket to Ribadu in 2011? It is apparent that there is a deliberate attempt at cover-up of all these alleged nefarious activities by one man. One can remember with nostalgia Tinubu's case at the Code of Conduct, but like a cat with nine lives, he still evades justice. The case against him was simple and grievous for any government official, not to talk of a governor that you, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, former governor of Lagos State, being a public officer as listed in Part 2 of the Fifth Schedule to the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and having subscribed to the Oath of Office as enshrined in the Seventh Schedule to the 1999 Constitution on assumption of office, as such engaged yourself in the operation and maintenance of several foreign bank accounts, namely First Heritage Bank USA, Citibank N.A., New York, Citibank International, New York, HSBC, 177 Great Portland Street, London, amongst several others. However, in what many have come to accept as a political deal for delivering the Southwest to the ruling PDP, the federal government let Tinubu off the hook and the matter was thrown out of the tribunal on technical grounds. But for how long can Tinubu evade justice? It will be interesting to follow up on what has happened to the EFCC intervention in the case of allegations of fraud leveled against Governor Fashola by a body known as the True Face of Lagos, which led to the arrest, detention and eventual release of one Dr. Tunji Ololafe, a prominent contractor and friend of both Tinubu and Fashola. He was arrested in Lagos by operatives of the EFCC following its investigation into allegations of financial crimes. Ololafe, a medical doctor and owner of Duke's Projects Limited, whose company was used as funds by the Lagos State Governor to execute inflated contract, was arrested on Friday, April 23, 2010, after investigators discovered that 27 contracts were awarded to the company from the State Ministry of Health and three from the Ministry of Education. Dr. Tunji Ololafe was allegedly paid 10 billion naira from Lagos State coffers as a front for Tinubu. In the last 10 years, tax revenue has come to constitute about 75% of government revenue base. Yet, the government never bothers to render account to taxpayers in Lagos. In the last three years alone, a colossal sum of 1.1 trillion naira was budgeted by the Lagos state government, with the government itself affirming that it has consistently recorded a minimum of 75% of budget performance, out of which 80% came from internally generated revenue, IGR. This is 30% more than the entire budgets recorded by successive governments between 1992 and 2007, a period spanning 15 years. The total tax revenue of Lagos last year, at the time of making the revelations, showed that tax on a monthly basis hovered between 14 and 17 billion naira, while federal allocation stood at 6 billion naira monthly. This is more than the revenue of seven states in Nigeria put together on a monthly basis. Lagosians, it's time to break from the stranglehold of one man. Tinubu's godfatherism is more akin to that of unscrupulous mafia dons in Sicily. It is more of gangsterism. Tinubu's gangster godfatherism 
means candidates for public office of his political party are not elected by popular vote, but selected from Tinubu's bedroom in Bodilian Road and then imposed on the party. They are then held under a tight leash by the Jagaban and are required to do his bidding on pain of being summarily replaced or impeached. B.C. Akonde, former chairman of Tinubu's legacy ACN party, declared unapologetically that democracy had no place in the internal arrangements of the ACN. Anyone that is not comfortable with that should go and contest in another political party, he said. APC, democracy or anti-democracy. Nothing has really changed in this stance beyond the fact that ACN has since metamorphosed into the APC. The first test was the so-called election of the chairman of the party. Instead of electing a new APC chairman, Odigie Oyegun was allegedly rigged into the office by Tinubu. Tom Ikimi blew the whistle on Tinubu, insisting he never dropped out of the race for Oyegun, but was forced out because at that time, Tinubu had designs for a Muslim-Muslim APC presidential ticket with him as the vice presidential candidate. Ali Modu Sharif was even reported to have been so incensed by Tinubu at an APC NEC meeting that he threatened to beat Tinubu up. Both of those men have since left the APC. The charade and the selection of a governorship candidate for Lagos was no different. A tiger never really changes its stripes. It was a rehatch of the primaries that brought in Fashola in 2007. Tinubu simply masterminded the primaries. Once the results started to be declared, the other contestants realized they had been conned. They all stormed out of the venue in protest, leaving only Ambode and Ghani Solomon. Tinubu pleaded with aspirants to accept the contrived outcome, saying, You are twelve aspirants, and like the twelve tribes of Israel, you have some differences, but you must remain one and united. It is ironic to point out that the twelve tribes of Israel were not united, instead they split with two tribes becoming the kingdom of Judah and the remaining ten the kingdom of Israel. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Maybe it would not be out of place to remind the Ashiwaju of history repeating itself in the next elections in Lagos. In 1991, the Social Democratic Party, SDP, won an overwhelming 26 of the 30 seats in the House of Assembly election. However, it lost the election of governor to the National Republican Convention, NRC, and Sir Michael Otedola became governor of Lagos as a result of conflict and split within the SDP. The evidence suggests that, no thanks to Tinubu's hijinks, history might repeat itself in 2015 with a probable loss of Lagos by the ruling APC to the opposition PDP. It has to be stressed that even Tinubu and Fashola have had their share of quarrels in the sharing of their spoils. The arrest of Olaolafe was said to be the climax of the bitter feud between Tinubu and his godson over certain fundamental issues, chief among which is the control of finances of the state. In December 2009, there were reports that Babatunde Fashola and Bola Tinubu had fallen out over the issue of whether Fashola should run for re-election in 2011, with Tinubu said to be supporting the Commissioner for Environment, Moise Baniri. Fashola's nemesis, as it were, was his complaint about the huge monthly deductions of over 3 billion naira from the state coffers every month as consultancy fee by Tinubu's tax company, Alpha Beta, from the almost 30 billion naira internally generated revenue, IGR. This day, December 19, 2009, in one of its articles, sums it up thus, Tunji Ololafe is a crony and convenient front for Tinubu. Sources claim that Tinubu's role in installing Fashola as governor of the state is the biggest hindrance for the present regime. An agreement between Fashola and Tinubu over the duration of the tenure of governorship, as well as the selection of certain cabinet members, paints a vivid picture on the sort of bind Fashola is in. And this bind will continue with the present governorship aspirant, Ambodi, 
if he is allowed to win the next elections in Lagos. Emperor Tinubu knows how to keep his acolytes under check. For those who might want to claim Ambode might be a man of his own, not under Tinubu. Governor Fashala still remains a case study for the alleged deviousness of Bola Ahmed Tinubu. There is the multi-billionaire Badagri Mile 2 10-lane highway built by Julius Berger and the Lekki Ekbe Highway which Tinubu arm-twisted Fashala and in short he got a 30-year concession to build, operate and transfer. For those who know the Lion of Badalian, it's all about the influence of Tinubu. He wants to run the government. He was angry Fashala wouldn't let him. He wanted the Badagri Mile 2 contract, but when Fashala gave it to Berger, because Tinubu had the Lekki Ekme deal, Tinubu got angry. It is believed that this one man, Tinubu, gets all he desires, and he is still not yet done. The alleged ownership of choice properties and businesses by former Lagos State Governor, Mr. Bola Ahmed Tinubu, valued at over 1 trillion naira, will rank him the most corruption-prone politician in Nigeria. Such properties and businesses include the Keja Shopping Mall, Oriental Hotel, Renaissance Hotel, First Nation Airline, Vintage Publications, Publishers of the Nation Newspapers, TV Continental, Radio Continental, and so many others. On the celebration of his 60th birthday, it was said he forced some APC, AC and then state governors, the 57 chairman of local government councils and the local council development areas of Lagos State to cough out 2 billion naira for the event. Though yet to be listed in the authoritative Forbes Fortune 100, Tinubu is arguably Nigeria's biggest landlord. His ownership of choice real estate and swaths of lands running into thousands of acres of public lands is second only to the federal government and the Lagos state government. In terms of direct cash value and return on investment, Tinubu's real estate holding may be worth more than even that of the federal government in Lagos state. Let's pause a minute and ask, how a man who was governor for eight years with fixed salary and allowances could have acquired so much money to buy almost everything in Lagos? Unknown to Nigerians, in 1993, six years before he ran for his first term in office in 1999, Tinubu was charged in the United States of America for narcotics or drug trafficking. Charged before the United States District Court, Northern District of Illinois, in a judgment that was docketed and dated 5th October 1993, the United States government compelled Tinubu to forfeit all sums in nine different accounts in First Heritage Bank, Citibank NA, and Citibank International. In the document titled, Decree of Forfeiture as the Fund Held in First Heritage Bank, it states clearly in Article A that, the United States filed a verified complaint for forfeiture against the funds in the above-captioned defendant, Tinubu's accounts, because there was no probable cause to believe that the property represented proceeds of narcotics trafficking or was property involved in financial transactions in violation of 16 U.S.C. S.S. 1956 and 1957 and therefore was forfeitable to the United States. It is alleged that Tinubu might have escaped physical time in prison by entering into a plea bargain and thus forfeited all funds in his accounts which were suspected to have been proceeds from narcotics or drugs to the United States court. Evidently, there is a lot more to Tinubu's dark past that millions of Nigerians are yet to unravel. Yes, there is housing scheme being built within the Eco Atlantic City development, which is marketed as a brand new city that excludes the hard-working people of Lagos. A brand new city where many plots of land cost in excess of a million dollars. A brand new city in which 120,000 will live and 250,000 will work, while millions of others remain trapped in abject poverty. The Eco Atlantic City project is reclaiming the ocean. Sadly, it is just pandering to the stereotype painted by the United Nations 
oceans of poverty contain in islands of wealth. It so happens that this particular island is being built with an ocean of wealth by an ocean that is flooding the accommodation of millions of less wealthy people across Lagos. Where are the new houses and improved infrastructure in Mushin, Alimosho, and Ajerumi Ifelodu? Or are they not part of Lagos? From the foregoing, there is no doubt that the regime of corruption in Lagos, initiated by Emperor Bola Ahmed Tinubu and continued by his godson Fashala, and to be continued by Ambode F. He wins, has put the southwest state in a serious deficit. Tinubu and his acolytes have put millions of Lagosians to 